Thanks everyone for joining us. Our talk today is five reasons you should care about drop size and speaking on the subject, our spray specialist, Justin Berger and Chad Sipperly, president of Step2 Incorporated. Chad is a consultant specializing in drop dynamics and spray diagnostics. Um, so before I let the guys here take it away, I will have my question and answer and chat features open. So please enter any questions you have throughout the talk. I'll interrupt Chad and Justin, make sure they answer them live. If we're unable to get to your question, no big deal. We'll reach out to you after the talk with a more detailed answer. Um, we'll also have a few polls pop up throughout our talk today. Uh, please use those because it'll help Chad and Justin kind of tailor the talk to your interests, which is going to be great. Um, so as Justin starts us off, we'll throw out our first poll and I'll post the results live in a couple minutes. Take it away, Justin. Hi, thanks, Mary, so much for uh, getting this organized. Um, so what we're looking at today is uh, five reasons that uh, you should, should really care about drop size. And we've got some really neat things on the horizon. Chad and I have had a, a lot of fun working on different projects, uh, really specific to the physics and getting down to the, the true why, why it matters and uh, really how we can help open up a dialogue for your specific applications and why that might be important. So what we're gonna look at today is number one, you're doing something uh, with a spray and that something is gonna affect something else. And we're gonna uh, really discuss how those interactions occur, not only from the drop size, but really what is going on after uh, a liquid leaves the nozzle and what you're trying to do. Uh, the second part that we're gonna look at is the physics. Uh, there, there are really some three uh, fundamentals that we're gonna look at. It's gonna be mass, momentum, and energy exchange. Those are the physics behind what we're working on. The third piece we're gonna look at are uh, droplet dynamics and the Goldilocks effect. It's uh, you know too hot, too cold, or just right. Uh, and really this concept is pretty important to hold in the back of our minds for different industries, different processes, and how we can find that region of just right for what we're looking to accomplish. Number four, we're gonna look at drop size can be measured. Uh, Chad is, a, is an expert at uh, doing the statistical analyses and understanding uh, the different methods and ways of measuring drop size. Also how the, the way you measure drop size will impact your results. And by impacting your results, it will impact your decision-making processes. And then the last piece, which I'm, I'm most excited about is uh, opening it up to, uh, to our attendees. This is your application. And we really like to have uh, that engagement and that ability for us to, uh, to have a conversation about uh, what pain points, what opportunities, and what specific challenges you might be seeing. Next slide. Uh, before I go there, I'll share the results with everybody. So there you guys go. Um, let's, let's keep going. Awesome. Petrochemical. I love it. So reason number one, you're spraying something to do something. And uh, Chad, you know, you, you've challenged me quite a bit as we've looked at different applications together, some pretty neat technologies. And I love how amidst all the complexities and all the math, all the physics, uh, you always ask me the question, what are we doing? And so can you describe what we're seeing here? You know, what's what's going on between our, our two videos that we have of this the, the, the droplets uh, being formed and as they escape into the atmosphere. Uh, sure, thanks Justin and thank you Mary for the introduction. Uh, and good morning everybody. Uh, so starting with the question of why are you spraying? So the spray process is fundamentally taking fluid in a bulk, breaking it into a bunch of little pieces and doing something with them. And that atomization process, that, that breaking into small pieces, is energy intensive, it's equipment intensive. So you're not doing it for no reason whatsoever. These are engineered systems we're dealing with here and, and you wanna get something out of your spray system. So in order to understand how the drop size distribution will affect your system, you, you have to understand what the goal that you're trying to accomplish. So what we're looking at in these two videos here are two atomization processes. 
upstream of these nozzles, you've got the liquid in a, in a column. It's, it's part of a bulk of a reservoir or pump system, something of that nature. And the physics of the nozzle are such that the flow passages thin the fluid out, apply turbulence, apply other uh, shear forces to the fluid. And the result is parcels of fluid. And I keep using the word parcels because they're not quite droplets yet. They break up into ligaments and those ligaments, or you know, even sheets break up into ligaments, break up into blobs that will eventually pull into roundness and turn into droplets. Uh, but during the atomization process itself, we're not really talking about droplets yet. It's a much more complicated environment. Of course, these are the initial conditions for the system. And everything that propagates downstream is, of course, influenced by these. The viscosity of the fluid, the geometry of the nozzle itself. There's so many dimensional, uh, so many possibilities for control that there's a lot of variation. So with that said, even with a single nozzle, just a single hydraulic nozzle, like on the left uh, video here, just changing the pressure is going to change the flow rate and the drop size distribution and the velocity distribution. And all of those changes potentially have an impact on the result that you're trying to accomplish. For most of us, the result is not the generation of the spray, it's why are we using the spray in the first place? Yeah, Chad, I like what you said, uh, you know, about all the up and downstream implications of a simple spray. And two, as you mentioned, the, the, the pressure increase and the flow increase, the spray itself even impacts the environment, right, uh, around it. And that can impact some of what we're trying to do or what we're trying to accomplish. Absolutely. These are fluid mechanic systems, uh, subsonic fluid mechanic systems. So that is to say that influences from the spray influence the ambient and vice versa. Uh, the in many types of atomization processes, the ambient plays a critically important role in inducing some of those breakup mechanisms. If the ambient changes, the actual drop size distribution will change. If you are trying to do coatings applications, for instance, the fact that the ambient, the air gets dragged along with the spray is going to influence the airflow, creating a, a flow at your target and then away from your target. And that flow away from the target because the gas can't go through a solid will carry some of those drops. And so that's going to be part of what we're going to be discussing here. I love it. And, you know, so here we're really looking at the, uh, the micro aspect of uh, spray, spray formation and what we're trying to do. On the next slide, we're gonna be looking more on the macro level. And um, so Mary, as we transition to that next slide, we're gonna be looking at these three things. Uh, it's that mass transfer, momentum, and energy. And uh, Chad, you know, those are the other fundamental pieces as we look at applications. Uh, not only are we looking at what are you trying to do? What is the micro level? And then we go out to the macro side uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the mass transfer, momentum, energy, and uh, all the fun excitement in between. Uh, before, uh, before Chad takes it away, I'm going to launch one more poll just so Chad can kind of uh, tailor these topics, mass, momentum, and energy to what you are using your spray for. All right. Thank you, Mary. Right. So we're trying to accomplish things with a spray at a macro level. We're trying to uh, cool a duct. We're trying to apply a coating to um, a, a surface. But the, the droplets themselves are, are at a microscopic scale. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar, we're talking about, you know, parcels of fluid in the, let's call it half a micron range up to a millimeter, two millimeters, somewhere in that range. Beyond that, you know, absolutely we can have droplets bigger than that. They tend to turn into blobs of fluid at that point. The physics are a little different. So in the micron range from let's say one to a thousand, we're dealing with physical processes at those length scales, which are eventually going to add up as an ensemble to accomplish whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish at the, the macroscopic scale. And so the first one, excuse me, while I look at the results here. So, oh, we've got combustion and reaction and cooling. Um, all right, that seems like a good distribution of applications here. Excellent. Uh, okay, so 
um, being a, an engineer, we always break things down into conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, and conservation of energy. That's, that's kind of the, the basics of the physical engineering uh, processes. So on a mass transfer basis, on a single drop, it's important to understand that the, the volume of the drop, and hence the mass of an incompressible fluid, goes as the cube of diameter. So whereas you might not think that the difference between a 10 micron drop and a 20 micron drop is very large, the actual volume contained in that drop is a factor of eight difference. So when we talk about sprays on a per droplet basis, the mass is very, very sensitive to the diameter of the particle that we're going to discuss. Obviously, if you're trying to transfer a certain amount of mass to a surface, or if you need a certain amount of mass for a, a cooling application, then having a certain amount of mass for the en entire ensemble is important. And the mass on a per droplet basis may not seem very important. But when we factor in momentum transfer, momentum is, is transferred by drag. Droplets are in, are in a continuum flow or a multi-phase flow. There is an exchange of momentum between the phases in the form of drag. It, the, the two phases will try and match velocities. In this instance, let's say in the example we're looking at in the video here, the droplets are the phase that has the velocity. They lose that velocity to the gas phase, which is accelerated. And then eventually viscous dissipation will take much of that energy and convert it into heat. But the important thing to understand here is that the momentum exchange as drag goes as either the diameter or the diameter squared, depending on whether we're at a very low Reynolds number of creeping flow or if we're in, in a turbulent flow. And if we look up above, mass transfer goes as d cubed. So the important takeaway of the momentum transfer is larger drops are accelerated by their drag forces less sensitively than smaller drops, which is to say smaller drops match the gas phase faster. This will become very important when we start talking about crossing streamlines or successfully applying droplets to surfaces uh, shortly. And then finally, the third physical consideration that we have to take into account is the energy transfer. Energy can't be created or destroyed. It's just moved around from one place to another, of course. And there, it, it may not be obvious to those who, who don't spend time in this field, but there's a, a potential energy involved in creating all of the surface between the liquid drops and the gas phase. And so to create clouds of little drops, you need an excessive amount of energy to create this surface potential. And now, if you actually work out the math, you say, but it's really not that large of a number. What's the concern here? The concern is that most atomization processes are not efficient at creating, at, at converting pump work into surface potential energy. Instead, a lot of the energy is converted into kinetic energy, into velocity. And so many times we want lots of little drops with lots of little surface, but we don't want the velocity change that comes along with putting in so much energy to the process. And then finally, and there were several folks uh, in the applications who suggested they were interested in, in vaporization, either for cooling or for combustion purposes, that the latent heat of vaporization of the liquid is also an important energy transfer mechanism of a spray. And so the ability of those droplets to soak up energy, but also the rate with which that energy can be extracted from the ambient environment is critically important to the physics of many spray applications. And obviously then the surface area, the surface area to volume ratios for sprays are important in the process itself. Yeah, Chad, I love how you, you broke it down to those three fundamentals. You know, we, we have a, quite a bit of the petrochem refining industry in here, and we're talking about, um, you know, we're trying to do something. We're trying to uh, affect, let's say, a gas stream. And it, it leads us into the next conversation really well, because if our droplets are too big, we might be doing something impinging on a wall. If they're too small, they might do certain things, and maybe they flash off way too early or... Um, we get some premature work that we're not looking to accomplish within a certain dwell time. And that's where it lends us to this, this piece where we have the Goldilocks effect, right? Droplet size uh, is a range, and we have to find the range that's just right for what we're looking at. If you look at the, this image here, 
um, you know, the first one, for example, we're spraying uh, some bread. And I've seen numerous times in these production plants where perhaps they're spraying oil or maybe it's an egg wash and they have way too much uh, force or mass momentum and not enough transfer efficiency and they're getting bounce back. And that bounce back is loss of, of energy, right? Chad just mentioned how expensive it is to, um, to produce a, a spray and for us to be able to find a way to optimize and to really find the most fruitful way to use the resources we've been given is, is critically important. So Chad, I'll let you take it away on our Goldilocks effect. Um, how, how can we make sure that our, that our porridge is just right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so you and I have discussed, and I've talked to many people in this race community for years on end. Um, when I or you talk to folks and say, well, what, what drop size are you looking for? The answer we inevitably get is going to be, I want the smallest drops possible. And the reality of the situation is, no, that's, that's not actually usually the case for most engineered applications. So in the end, for an engineered system, it's a series of trade-offs. There are cost functions to things, be it energy costs, be it the liquid that you're spraying, uh, be it the environmental or safety considerations. Uh, and then there are performance uh, metrics as well. How well did you coat your bread with your egg wash as, as your example here? And so we're gonna go into a couple of examples of how drops end up just right. And let me circle back to the very first point, which is the right drop size is what's right for your application. And, and it, it's very specific to you. Every engineered system can benefit from the optimal drop size, but they don't all have the same drop size. So I will give a couple of examples of how drop size matter, um, but then at the end, we're going to open it for some Q&A on your drop applications because it, it's really very specific. So a couple of examples will help you understand the context and then we'll, we'll bring it in more specific to your applications. So Mary, if you can give us the next slide, please. Okay, so here's a slide you weren't expecting, I'm certain. One of the best ways to explain the optimal drop size is to consider hairspray. And you might not stop to consider the cosmetics industry as a, as a major user of, of sprays, but the correct drop size distribution and creating that drop distribution with a very inexpensive spray system is critically important to the performance of hairspray. Let me explain why. In one sense, we talked about before that little drops match the gas phase flow more quickly. So at a microscopic scale, the airflow is going to go around a hair strand. If the droplets are too small, those drops are, are become tracer particles. They're gonna follow the air around the hair. They're not gonna land at all. That's wasted product. It's, it's bad for the environment. This overspray is, a, is an issue in almost all coatings applications. But even still, if a droplet of the hairspray lands on a hair strand and it's too small to reach another hair strand or it, it, there's not enough of the adhesive material to join those strands of hair, then it's also wasted product. It's not performing in any way, shape or form as holding the hair. On the flip side, if the drops are too large, then they will carry a lot of mass and they will grab several hair uh, strands of hair and your hair begins to look weighted and matted as if the humidity is, is too high. So there is in fact a just right region for a hairspray, which dictates what the drop size distribution should be. And it's not one exact drop size, mind you, it is a range, but the cosmetics industries who make hairspray absolutely have a target distribution range in terms of droplet diameter and velocity that they want coming out of their nozzle and they want their users to apply it to, you know, from exactly the correct distance away because that will give the optimal results when using hairspray. So that's just the first example and we'll go on to the next slide for a more industrial example. So here we're looking at a um, gas quenching application um, where exhaust gases uh, from some sort of process are being cooled uh, either before release into the atmosphere or before going into other machinery. Uh, so these are the kind of simulations that uh, the folks here at Spraying Systems can provide to customers to optimize their systems. 
So in a gas quench application, you might say to yourself, well, I want the smallest possible drop because they're going to vaporize fastest and then I don't have to worry about them impacting on the far wall. And that would be great if you could put an array of nozzles across your entire flow such that those little drops could be applied everywhere. But that's hardware expensive. It creates a pressure drop and it may disturb your flow in entirely too much. The, better engineering solution is to accept that, no, my vaporization time is going to be longer. And so my uh, dwell time and my dwell length is going to be longer. But for less hardware, I can have a small number, finite number of nozzles of varying sizes. So the little drops will evaporate locally to the nozzle and they will cool that gas. But as we mentioned before, the big drops, they lose their velocity more slowly. So they can go further into the flow field. They can cross those streamlines in order to interact with the hot gas away from the nozzle and distribute the, the, the ability to absorb energy from the, the continuum. Their latent heat of vaporization can be distributed across the flow and all of the flow then can be cooled. That way we don't have to rely on turbulent mixing at small scales throughout the entire device to accomplish the same thing. Yeah, Chad, what, you know, what's interesting here too is um, oftentimes we'll get, you know, I want the smallest drop size, right? And we hear that a lot and, uh, you know, there's always a distribution, but I love how you mentioned uh, the, the beauty of that diversity of that drop size to be able to localize, right? With the smaller droplets, it's impacting and doing its heat transfer there. That's great locally, but the bigger droplets have a use, they have a purpose to be able to get further into that gas stream because they, they you know, the, the energy transfer and those things that you mentioned on the macro scale. And then guess what? It gets to dwell and travel a little bit longer. On this specific application on this study, uh, you know, we're doing the NOx control. Uh, if certain uh, industries are out of compliance on that side, the fines can be very heavy, very high. And uh, a fundamental understanding of what we're finding in industry is the, the engineers are asking the right questions, you know, uh, instead of saying, oh, I'm just gonna inject XYZ ammonia, we're gonna call it good. Suddenly they're starting to wanna get more optics into this process. They're wanting to understand not only pressures and flows, which is great, but what does pressure and flow do to my drop size? And not only what does it do to my drop size, but what implications does that, uh, that, does that extra work that we're doing have on my downstream and my upstream uh, processes and conditions. And, um, you know, we, we're, we're looking at those fundamental questions. It's, it's wonderful to be able to look down, get to the microscope level, uh, down to drop size, and then also get all the way up to um, uh, the macro level, you know, using the microscope and the telescope uh, at the same time. And uh, Chad, I just love that, that picture that I think is a, an important concept for us to hold, that mental model of, hey, drop size, small, good, yes, great for gas interaction. And then, um, you know, also getting that speed in those pieces. And, and Mary, I see that we, we might have a couple of questions here. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Um, we have a question, is there an optimal distribution? Is it bimodal? I'll, I'll take that uh, question. Um, unfortunately, there's no optimal distribution that's a universal distribution. Um, there, there are absolutely um, optimized distributions on a per application basis. Uh, and so sometimes those, uh, those distributions are in fact bimodal uh, during gas turbine engine uh, injector startup, for instance, there's, an extra number of, of small drops that are, so that there's a bit of extra fuel that's added during the, the startup process that will not be there during the uh, steady state combustion uh, process. And so that process is very bimodal during the startup. And then after that, it, it goes more into a, a single mode system. But uh, let me just reemphasize that the exact, and, and, and to say exact is wrong, the, the optimized, because it will be a trade-off with other performance systems is always application specific. Uh, and before we move on from, from this topic, uh, the, the Goldilocks effect, we don't have a, a fancy video for surface coating, but let me just use painting as an example. It's something that everybody is, is familiar with. If your drops are too small and you're injecting at too high of a velocity, the induced airflow is going to create 
a recirculation zone that takes the air away from the surface back out behind where the paint nozzle is. If your drops are too small, they're going to be sucked away from the surface where you want them to, to coat. If your drops are too large, they're potentially going to impact the surface and have too much uh, momentum. The viscous dissipation won't be able to get them to stick when they hit the surface and they may rebound. And again, you'll have wasted material. But more than that, more than just the transfer efficiency, we also have a quality issue that we've got to discuss. A paint is uh, some sort of pigment carried in solvent and we need that solvent to evaporate off to create a, a, a solid surface with a, a, a desired finish. Usually let's say, let's call it a glossy finish, okay? And so as the drops are flying through the air, they are vaporizing to a certain extent. And as they hit the surface, they're continuing to, the, the solvent is continuing to vaporize off, leaving only the pigment behind. And so what we want to have happen is just the right amount of time that a droplet can hit so that surface tension can spread it out flat, but then it needs to get rid of its solvent so that it doesn't then drip down the surface. So painting it can be a very challenging application to get just the right drop size that you're looking for to achieve a desired result. Yeah, Chad, I, I like that, uh, that analogy. And you know, too, um, uh, Reza, I love your question, you know, for each application. And one thing that I've noticed is we're, we're, we're working against entropy, right? And to combat that, we, uh, we're gonna need more intelligence, more information. And I think what we're, you're gonna find interesting on the next slide, what we're talking about is uh, what gets measured is what gets improved and what we can start controlling for. And I really think that that's gonna come down to, you know, we measure pressures and flows, well, what if, in a process, we could actually measure, uh, you know, spray distribution. What if uh, we had the optics and the ability to measure drop size? And, and Chad, maybe we'll be able to kind of address that a bit more further uh, when we look at the different capabilities and how we can measure drop size and perhaps how that can help to inform an optimized uh, process specific to a design system, an engineered system. Right, thanks, Justin. So reason for, we can measure drop size. It, it seems kind of silly to have to, to state this out, but if you can't measure something, you can't optimize that part of a system. And your system, whatever your engineered system is, has some cost basis to it. There is a certain trade-off for our yield, for our per unit cost, for our consumables, for our environmental impact, and all of these sorts of things. And in the more... Uh, highly engineered systems, which is to say when you're, when you're trying to eke out the last mm, percent, half a percent, tenth of a percent of performance from a system, your understanding of the physics and your, your physical representation in, in some sort of model must get better and better and better. And the data that you feed to those models must improve likewise to the point that, uh, about half and half on the full results, uh, when, to the point that at the highest, most complicated end of engineering systems, we're going to be using computer modeling, CFD, alongside of experimentation to determine the optimal system. Now, CFD is great in that you get a very, very detailed look into the physics, all the microphysics that we've been talking about so far. But good CFD has to be grounded in physical results that match with performance systems. It's very difficult to do measurements of real, real world combust or, uh, spray systems. So instead we're gonna have a model system that's a simplified environment, it's simplified conditions. We make sure the CFD can match the simplified conditions. It's called validating the model. And then you can use the CFD with the higher geometric complexity. CFD is much happier to deal with geometric complexity than is instrumentation. So along those lines, there's differing levels of optimization. At, at, at one end, you may only be interested in the, the five or 10% performance range. At the other end, you may be interested in the 10th of a percent or better performance range. And so there's instrumentation at varying levels of complexity and expense and detail as well. There are ensemble scattering instruments, which essentially take all of the drops that are in a laser beam, and sometimes that laser beam is, you know, a couple of centimeters in diameter. Sometimes it's, you know, 
15, 20 centimeters in diameter. But all of the drops that are influenced by that laser beam are measured all at once. We're looking at their diameter distribution of all of these drops all at once. And that's great for lots of applications. If your application is um, agricultural spraying, for instance, the, the spray is already spread out to a very large uh, volume. There's a lot of mixing. There's not a lot of spatial um, differences that are worried about by the time all the nozzles have been you know, lined up in a row. And so the fact that we could just quickly get a characterization of the spray as a, as a one number representation is a very useful property of those instruments. They're relatively inexpensive devices, which is to say they're expensive, but not uh, absurdly so, um, but they're, they're very fast. They provide results in very real time. Um, the group at uh, Spraying Systems here is developing their own line of, of spray scan equipment, including one of these ensemble type scattering instruments, which is not absurdly expensive. It's really intended for industrial applications. So shout out to them uh, for the one in the bottom right corner here. So that's the, the simpler end of the spectrum. And that would be good for zeroth and first order uh, optimizations of processes. At the other extreme, where we're talking about um, combustion systems, where we're trying to get combustion efficiencies up beyond 99%, we're trying to get trace gas emissions of incredibly sensitive uh, chemical processes that depend greatly on the environment in, in the combustion chamber. We really need to have detailed information of how the spray droplets interact with the gas phase environment and, and the reaction environment around them. And so on the bottom left over here, uh, and I think the video just ran out, uh, there we go is an instrument called a phase Doppler interferometer. This is kind of the other end of sprays diagnostics. This is a point measurement. So that means that you're measuring only a very small region, perhaps a characteristic dimension of a few hundred micron at a time. But in that region, we're going to get representation of the droplet diameter and velocity for every droplet that passes through. Remember when we were talking about drag before, momentum exchange, when you're looking at vaporization and, and uh, chemical reaction effects, the, the relative velocity between the droplet and the environment dictates uh, the vaporization properties of the droplet as well. So the phase Doppler creates a much more detailed view into a spray, but because it's a pointwise measurement, we have to raster that measurement point to many locations of the spray. The data processing is more complicated and the spray is not reduced to a single number that represents the whole spray. And I apologize, I should have opened with this comment, but in general, we never care about the drop, the, the, the size of a single droplet, unless we're an inkjet printer company who's interested in creating the same drop over and over and over again. For the most part, what we're interested in is how the drops act as an ensemble. And so all of these instruments will be reporting a distribution of results, which is to say, we don't have a drop size. And that's a common misperception when talking about a spray is that the spray is a size. The spray may be characterized by a certain statistical representation where we might say the solder mean diameter is 75 micron or the median volume diameter or the DV90, DV10, are the, this number or that number. And in various industries, there are various regulations or there are various correlations based on these statistics. But a spray that has a solder mean diameter of 75 micron has a wide range of drop sizes. It is simply that the distribution can be represented with a statistical representation of a 75 micron solder mean. Yeah, Chad, I, I really like the, you know, you, you went through the detail of how are we going to capture this data and how can it be leveraged? How can we utilize it? And what we're finding in industry, uh, you know, folks are looking to capture more and more value. And I assess anywhere there is a spray, particularly petrochem refining, uh, chemical plants, uh, pharmaceutical, even agriculture, if we can optimize and enhance that transfer efficiency to do something, to do the thing that we, we are charged uh, to do, there's a, there's a lot of optimization opportunity uh, in that. And the way we inform that optimization 
is through real data and by being able to interpret that data and to do something with it, right? Because we're, we're, we're gonna do something with the data because we understand we want the sprays to do something. And then by creating those different mental models that Chad's helped us to, to unpack, we, perhaps we can look at our, uh, our applications a little bit, uh, little bit differently as we progress. And uh, so, you know, we went from the micro to the macro level. We went to uh, all kinds of, of neat aspects of the, the drop size and then how to measure it. Uh, you know, the last piece, which I'm most excited for, is we want to hear from you guys. We want to hear uh, what's your application. Perhaps uh, you, you can open up and share a little bit about your process. And Chad and I can um, uh, discuss uh, some opportunities or how a drop size might, uh, we might glean more information for, uh, for greater opportunity. And Mary, we can go on to that next slide here. All right, this is where we want to hear from you. If you have an application question specific to evaporation, cooling, whatever, um, let us know now and Chad and Justin will address them. Uh, we'll give you a couple minutes to do that. In the meantime, Chad, you could always share an anecdote. We always love to hear them. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, so we didn't talk about um, agricultural spray. So th this, is, this is an obvious one where the drop size distribution matters. So while people are either typing in their questions or raising their hands, I'll, I'll talk about ag for a second. Um, in agricultural spray, we're typically either spraying pesticides or some sort of fertilizer, food, something for, for the plants. They have different targeted regions. Uh, a pesticide may only work well if it ends up on the, the canopy, if it ends up on the leaves, whereas the nutrients may need to penetrate to the soil of the crop. In neither application do we want small particles to drift in the wind into the uh, kindergarten playground next door, okay? That's just envir environmentally unacceptable. And so there are absolutely regulations uh, attached to every chemical in terms of how it's intended to be sprayed, whether the spray should be a fine or a coarse or, or you have it. Um, but if the drops are too small, they're going to drift. We discussed that already. But if the drops are too large, especially if we're trying to land on the canopy, We've, we've discussed that the, the large drops have more momentum, they have more inertia. And if they hit a leaf and they've just got too much inertia, they might just bounce off the leaf and fall down onto the soil. And so we don't want, we don't want liquid that's targeted for the canopy to end up on the soil. Uh, if we do in fact want to spray the soil, then that's really kind of easy because frankly, we can you know, just make the drops all, just about as large as we want. and you know, they'll make it down to the, the, the bottom. It, they won't stop on the leaves. So uh, it looks like we have at least uh, one question to go. So I'll let Mary yeah. send it in. Chad, I love this question and uh, we run into it and I, I don't, I assess it's case by case, but uh, you know, the difference between a full cone and a hollow cone nozzle and Lynn, I love this question, the gas gas exchanger uh, for hydrate control. So if you're looking for advantages and uh, differences between each nozzle. And Chad, based off of your experience, uh, you've measured and looked at a number of different drop size. Um, and Lynn, perhaps uh, you can type in, you know, the, the goal, you know, what we're looking at for that hydrate control. And then Chad, perhaps you can explain, uh, you know, the fundamental difference between a full cone and a hollow cone, but also what's that uh, resulting drop size typical distributions for similar parameters? Right. So, uh, so for those that don't know, a, a hollow cone nozzle sends the majority of its mass into a cone, which is to say a liquid sheet breaks up and the drops travel on a trajectory at a certain angle from the nozzle for, to, for first order approximation. And the, the reason that one would use a hollow cone nozzle versus a solid cone nozzle, where the, the drops are distributed everywhere, in the, the cone of the nozzle is exactly because the drop size distribution matters. The, and not only does the drop size matter, the spatial distribution of the drop sizes matter. So my background is combustion. So I will use an example from the combustion world. 
when we want to burn a liquid, they don't burn not well. You really need to vaporize that liquid to mix it with the oxidizer. And then that reaction can propagate to more and you can initiate the, the energy release and it will remain a stable flame. Now, the problem here is that if we have too much fuel in an area, in the, the high flux region of a, of a hollow cone nozzle, there's too much fuel for the flame to propagate into that area. So we can't easily create a flame that stabilizes right up near a nozzle if the nozzle itself is just spewing fuel in all directions at high flux with large drops. So instead, a hollow cone nozzle allows you the opportunity to create what are called recirculation zones. Now, it, remember, drag imparts velocity on the gas phase. So as the spray is coming out of a hollow cone nozzle, it's dragging air with it. And conservation of mass doesn't like that. It, it has to replace that mass of air loss. That air must come from somewhere. So on the outside of the cone, there's an external recirculation zone where gas comes from further down in the device or from the ambient out, outside somewhere, and it's sucked in on the outside. On the inside, there's an internal recirculation bubble that's formed as well. Both of these recirculation bubbles will drag small drops with them, because remember, small drops follow the flow, while the big drops continue to carry on further into the flow. These small drops will tend to evaporate more quickly than the large drops. So they're given a bit of residence time as they circle around one direction or the other, and they're now vapor. And so if I have a flame up near the edge of the nozzle, I now have evaporated drops that have had a chance to mix with the oxidizer. And now I have fresh air fuel mixture that meets the flame and that keeps the flame fed and that keeps the flame from blowing out. So a hollow cone nozzle is much more complicated physics, but allows you then much more complicated processes where you get these recirculation zones, where these small drops can be sucked in and evaporated and stabilize a flame. Whereas the large drops, they carry further into the combustion region, they more slowly evaporate. They give the oxidizer time to mix in with the fuel vapor as it's released. So we don't end up with a fuel rich burned region, we end up with a properly mixed burned region. And so you have a, a volume over which the energy is released. Now, uh, what was the application again here? I'm sorry. Uh, it's, it's in Jack. Yeah, it's uh, EG injection to prevent hydrates as the gas is cooled. And they typically recommend hollow cone nozzles for this process. Yeah, Chad. And, and two, I think that's a, a very important piece. You know, in, in looking at the hollow cone versus a uh, full cone, um, you know, typically we'll see a smaller droplet, right, with our, our hollow cone nozzles. And Chad, can you speak a bit? Uh, I love what Clint brought up as well with the relative span factor. You know, so, you know, that can you ex unpack the RSF for folks as well? And then perhaps we can apply that to our hollow cone, full cone discussion as well. Sure. So the, the span factor is a measure of, of how poly dispersed a spray is, which is to say, when I mentioned before that a spray has a distribution, sometimes it's a very narrow distribution. So we would call that a, a, a narrow or a monodisperse even distribution, which is to say all of the droplets are one size. Size in a polydispersed system, you have a mixture of large drops and small drops, and again, very application specific. But in general, having a mixture of spray droplets and and usually the the spray drop size is really a proxy for having a mixture of droplet momentum. That having a mixture of droplet momentums and inertia allows you to get more enhanced mixing than you might otherwise be able to get if you had a very narrow distribution. A narrow drop size means that all of the drops are behaving in a similar fashion. And so they're all going to tend to reach the same area, evaporate at the same rate, do whatever it is they're going to do at about the same time. Whereas a larger span factor on nozzles will tend to vary those time delays, distance delays, spatial distribution, it enhances those distributions. For some applications, that's great. For some applications, that's death. So again, it's, it's always very application specific, just how much of a variation 
your application would benefit from. I, I love that, Chad. And, uh, you know, we have a couple of other questions here. Um, Actually, this is a good one from, from Michael Powers. Uh, his understanding of velocity, large and small droplets are the same when leaving nozzles, regardless of pressure, only changing uh, once the droplet has started to move away from the nozzle. And he's asking if that part is, is true from the physics standpoint. Uh, that's mostly true. Um, even at the, and again, this will vary on a per atomizer type. This, this is really getting into atomiz atomization physics, which is actually its own area of expertise. Um, but I, I know enough, I can, I can handle this one, I think. Um, the actual atomization process is a combination of instability modes that take a bulk of fluid and break it because some variation in surface tension is no longer stable and will naturally pinch itself off from the rest of the flow. So in certain atomization modes, the internal turbulence of the stream itself is responsible for a large fraction of that variation of, and of that instability. So diesel injectors, for instance, the turbulence in the core of the liquid as it's coming out of the injector, the intensity of that turbulence is really what dictates how small the particles are. And it doesn't look if you look at the, the microscopic images of, of diesel atomization, it looks nothing like what we were seeing earlier, where you have sheets of liquid breaking up into ligaments, breaking up into droplets. What you see is a rough column where little drops are just jumping off of the surface. They literally are ejecting themselves because that's turbulent eddies. We're carrying the momentum of a bit of fluid with enough velocity to the surface. It just pops right off the surface and goes off into the, the flow field. Obviously, the core itself experiences some instability modes and there's some other breakup mechanisms, but the atomization process will have a distribution of velocities. It's not going to be uniform. It will, it will be centered and it will be much more narrow than what you're going to experience downstream, absolutely. Now, the minute that you begin to interact with an environment, yes, the velocity distribution will change and the little drops will change faster. In some applications, like an air assist atomizer, for instance, the little drops, well, in that situation, the air is going faster than the, the liquid. So the little drops will come up to speed faster than the large drop. In a hydraulic atomizer, the liquid is going faster. The large drops will stay fast and the little drops will slow down. So you're absolutely correct that at the atomizer, the velocities are more similar, but it's still not a uniform velocity environment. Yeah, I, I appreciate that that piece of it too. You know, so the in sum, the velocity exiting at the nozzle is similar, not necessarily exact. Once it gets to the environment, uh, the, the mass and everything that that impacts it greatly. You know, and and two right. And on let me interrupt you. Start start for a second, Justin. Uh, let me interrupt because I'm going to follow up with that thought right there. If we think about the microscale physics of what, what's happening at the atomizer surface, especially any kind of atomizer that has a, a filming surface where an intact sheet is thinning down to a very small length scale on that surface. We still have a no-slip condition at the interface between the liquid and the nozzle itself. We still have a velocity gradient in that film. And so therefore that gradient is going to be seen in the velocity di distribution of the particles. Sorry for interrupting. Back you go. No, no, I love it. And you know, this lends us to our next conversation. Uh, Reza, you asked in cooling applications, is it uh, possible to design the liquids, liquid such that uh, the evaporation rate is controlled? And I think what you might be referring to is uh, something we use as a, as a nice tool in our, our toolbox is uh, our turndown ratio. And that's a way for us to, on the fly, with a two-fluid nozzle, to adjust up to a certain degree our droplet size, right? And so droplet size, uh, you have a certain surface area, the smaller you go, the greater your surface area, thus the, the more evaporation can occur over the larger droplets. And, and so uh, I think whenever you're looking at another knob to turn, yeah, that, that, that's another option. Uh, one example is your atomizing air. You leave that the same depending on the type of nozzle but you back off your liquid flow. So you're gonna be flowing less, but you're gonna have smaller droplets. And like Chad mentioned, the physics behind 
uh, you know, the order of magnitude of getting those smaller droplets and what that can mean from a heat transfer standpoint is, is pretty important. Um, so uh, in, in a short answer, yes, but the challenge is, and this is what, we're, um, what we will achieve, is to be able to understand when we play with that turn down ratio, what actual impact is that going to have? How do we quantify that and get some feedback loops? Right now, what happens in industry and processes that maybe they have a goal or a target temperature, and that's where they can tune and adjust things on the fly. But what if we were able to actually uh, assess and interrogate and understand a little bit more of, of what's going on, or perhaps we model it through CFD and say, hey, with this turn down ratio, here's what we expect. And Chad, you know, with looking at two fluid nozzles and you're looking at that evaporation piece and, and really how do we, um, in the lab, let's say, how do we uh, discern what that looks like, right? Uh, whenever you're measuring a very chaotic environment, how do we measure what's happening with that turn down ratio? What have you seen? Uh, absolutely. So the, in terms of a two fluid uh, atomizer versus uh, a single fluid, let me just start there. So a, a single fluid nozzle, which is to say a hydraulic atomizer, we pressurize the liquid and we spray it out of the, out of the nozzle. The flow rate obviously is a function of the pressure that we're supplying to the nozzle. However, the potential energy that we've got in terms of the pressure leads to the instability modes affects also the drop size distribution. So in a, hydraulic nozzle, the flow rate and the drop size are coupled to one another. We cannot independently change one or another. One solution around that is to use a pulse width modulated system, such as the, the pulse jet system uh, that spraying system offers, where I want a certain drop size and I want, a, I want small drops, but I want lower flow rate than I would otherwise get. So I'm just not going to spray all the time. I'm going to pulse and I'm going to turn off and wait. And that works very well for many applications. In fact, cooling may very well work for such a system. Another option to decouple the drop size and the liquid flow rate is what Justin mentioned, which is a two fluid atomizer, which is to say we have typically a gas, uh, typically air, working with the liquid atomization process. Sometimes we have an atomization process that's then affected by the gas. Sometimes the gas is part of the atomization process. Both of these have results where the drop size distribution is somewhat decoupled. We don't have infinite flexibility, of course, but we have a map now that we can map things out. And so in the lab, understanding processes requires that we explore those different operating spaces for these nozzles such that the nozzle is barely flowing at a very high pressure, but it's also a very uh, high air supply pressure. So the difference in that the liquid is actually experiencing is very small, even though the whole system pressure is very high versus at the other end, that same flow rate, but at lower air and liquid pressures are going to have two different atomization characteristics. So in the ideal world for a, a gas cooling application as was requested, we would know the entire temperature map, not just a temperature, but the temperature map of the airflow coming in. We would have a series of nozzles, which are individually addressable. We would know this map would be most ideally uh, quenched with this combination of droplet distributions and number densities, which is to say mass flow rates as well. And then at the end, you would monitor the temperature map of your duct and use that as a feedback on your control loop. That's obviously much more advanced modeling than is used in most industrial applications. But as the ability to do the diagnostics gets less expensive, then it becomes more opportune. And as honestly, as CFD prices, you know, computers get more powerful every year, doing a CFD simulation of realistic physics gets less expensive every year. So more and more systems are available to model in such a way that we could create the reduced order model to represent that system and its array of nozzles. Yeah, thank you for that, Chad. And um, you know, this brings us now to our next one, speaking of environments, uh, reduced order models or ROMs, 
Uh, Evan, you, you have an ethylene glycol uh, tube sheet application, and I've been fortunate enough to work on one of these for, for quite a while, where we did, uh, we've done uh, very complex CFD studies, and your challenge is ensuring that the ethylene glycol gets on the whole tube face. And on a heat exchanger, oftentimes, uh, whenever we're trying to inject something and, and do something, there's either, uh, there's another gas, and sometimes that gas is moving very, very quickly. What we've learned over our years and uh, over studying and doing numerous CFDs as, a, as an overall uh, heuristic is the upstream uh, gas uh, processes and flow matter tremendously. We've learned that gas has a bit of a memory effect, and that memory effect, as it's traveling, you know, let's say it's upstream and you have your tube sheet, all these eddies come and some of those eddies can become uh, exponentially uh, circulating or more turbulent. And if the injector is uh, coming into the way of that, that real turbulent gas stream trying to spray, what we find is most of your ethylene glycol is shooting straight down to the bottom. And one of the easy pivots is to actually, and it's, it can be expensive, but perhaps you, you cut open that tube sheet and you get a whole bunch of nozzles to where they're not as impacted by that prevailing gas stream. So oftentimes in industry, we do see, uh, oh, we're just going to put an injector here. But oftentimes if that velocity is uh, relatively high and the, depending on the drop size that you're playing with, uh, a lot of your rheology might be dumping straight down to the bottom. And if you're trying to unclog or prevent a tube sheet from becoming occluded, it's important to understand those dynamics. And there are some heuristics that can be at play. However, um, we get humbled very, uh, very quickly on the CFD studies by what we think in our mind might be happening. There's some eddy currents upstreams that uh, we can't account for. And we see these recirculation zones and uh, certain drop sizes, uh, like what Chad mentioned, due to the momentum and all of those other physics uh, and those constraints, they'll pull down and go where they don't wanna go. There's one instance, in fact, where the injector itself was getting in the way uh, of the fluid dynamics for uh, similar for an ethylene glycol project. And whenever we sprayed these small droplets, because of that injector coming down overhead and the gas stream coming here, there was a pressure differential and I want to say about 30 to 40% of the droplets because there was, a, there was a little space here where the velocity, where there was a void, if you will. The droplets shot straight up, hit the top of the, uh, of the tube sheet, and then they condensed and fell straight down. And so uh, it's just fascinating whenever you really get into that detail um, and how important all of these, um, uh, these pieces are, are really at play. So the upstream conditions, downstream conditions, drop size matters um, uh, tremendously. So Evan, we're, we're happy to speak a, a bit more uh, offline uh, for you guys and, and discuss that ethylene glycol uh, project on your uh, shell and tube uh, heat exchanger. Let's see, it looks like we have another question here. Let's see what we got. Do you want to take uh, Lillian's question about yeah, Lillian, um, the, the high volume hydrocarbon evaporating chemical reaction? Yeah, uh, Lillian, so you're really looking at uh, those uh, Optimax type uh, injectors that we were looking at. And another piece that Chad was mentioning earlier, you're looking at that two fluid because you want that high volume, but you also need smaller droplets. So the a good way, an economical way to do that is to throw a lot of liquid through a nozzle, but then you need some, uh, some break up there. You're going to throw a secondary uh, atomizing gas to then break up that bulk liquid, like what Chad was describing. Um, and Lillian, there's a, there's a lot of other opportunities and um, uh, collaboration that we can look at uh, specific to what your plant is looking at. Yeah, Lillian. Let me... Um... Uh, let me expand on uh, that answer for a second. So when we're dealing with evaporation, especially, that means that the spray is evolving as it's moving into the system. So it, it's not like a, a, a coating application where pr primarily the droplets that enter are the ones that end up on the surface. In an evaporation system, be it combustion or cooling, the net result is that at the end, we don't have any drops anymore. So 
again, on the per application basis, the physics of what's happening being drop dynamic, uh, drop diameter sensitive is not just at the atomizer face. It is the drop distribution and the momentum distribution throughout the entire spray volume. So when we talk about optimizing a system, especially for an evaporating system, we've got to take measurements and do the calculations throughout the whole system until it ends. And that's what those, the cooling tower simulation that we were looking at, for instance, was doing exactly that. Yeah, thank you for that, Chad. Um, well, we are at our 11 o'clock hour. Um, and what we'll do is we'll, we'll wrap up here. We're happy to take these conversations offline, Mary, if we could go to uh, the next slide. And we'll just uh, kind of recap what all we looked at. Um, you know, we, we looked at, um, you know, the five pieces here. So why we care about drop size, you're gonna do something to affect it. The physics that matter. So we went to, uh, you know, to kind of the, the, the macro level, micro level. Uh, the Goldilocks effect, uh, Chad was uh, very eloquent at describing the necessity of having the right temperature porridge. And, uh, you know, the fourth we were looking at, drop size can be measured. He shared with us all the different tools that are in place. And two, we have the exciting new technologies uh, on the spray scan aspect to interrogate your uh, sprays and to get you a little bit more optics uh, on the back end as well. And then fifth, we looked at a number of applications. Uh, we really appreciate y'all's time. Uh, Mary and our, our team will be reaching out to, uh, to you guys to give y'all our, our uh, information. And two, you'll notice there's going to be a link as well at the very bottom of that email to where if you guys wanted to speak a little bit about your application with uh, Chad or myself, it'll tie direct to our, uh, to our calendars and we'll be able to get you guys to that regional expert to, uh, that's closest to you to look at your application. Chad, it's always fun. I look forward to the next one. And Mary, thank you so much as well. Um, we, we look forward to seeing you guys on the next, uh, the next webinar.